Live from SAVC headquarters in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, welcome to this evening's episode of The Watchdog. My name is Vuyo Vogo, and thank you for tuning in. Here's what we have in store for you this evening. A day after the ANC leadership gives its government deployees their marching orders, the country's, uh, some of the country's foremost analysts share their initial thoughts on some of the proposals party president Cyril Ramaphosa read out yesterday. They will also weigh in on the politics of the weekend meeting at which the ANC NEC also rallied around Ramaphosa over the Lindy Wasisulu matter and the pending Scopa probe. And in news just in, the ANC MP who was suspended from asking Parliament to probe Ramaphosa over allegations of misuse of public funds has just filed court papers. Mervyn Dirks wants to be immediately reinstated and wants the ANC to stop meddling in the work of Parliament. We we'll speak to his lawyer, Godrich Gardi. All that and more coming up in tonight's episode of The Watchdog, which starts now. Well, regression of ethical and moral leadership has resulted in an existential crisis, says President Ramaphosa. He says the ANC's credibility and legitimacy is being undermined by its inability to act. Take a listen to some of what he had to say yesterday at the end of that ANC NEC Lechutla, which took place over the weekend. The challenge is to lead all sectors of South Africa towards a new and resilient social compact to build an inclusive society, but to build also an inclusive economy that brings a change in the quality of life for all South Africans. An effective social compact will require give and take by all parties, social partners, as all parties need to contribute in the cause of national development. In addition to this, it will be necessary to identify trade-offs social partners will need to act on. The compact will need to set out a collective commitment to implement measures and targets to place our nation on a higher growth path aimed at addressing our common national challenges of poverty, unemployment and inequality. In this type of compact, obligations and commitments will need to be set out. Commitments and obligations that government will need to act on, business will need to commit itself to, labor will also need to be part thereof and communities as well. And this will help us to decisively address our nation's lasting challenges. The Khutla felt that social compacting that we're talking about should not be limited to large formal sector entities and be limited just to big government and big entities at the national level, but should also include the participation of our communities at local level, small businesses, township businesses and cooperatives. We have found that 
many of these locally based formations are very keen to be part of a social compact which can be most effective in dealing with problems and challenges at that low level. The Lakota reaffirmed that economic recovery efforts to stimulate growth, investment and employment must also be accelerated. Fundamental to this must be increased funding for urgent programs to improve the basic services our people live, such as access to water, electricity, roads, and bridges for communities both in urban and rural communities or areas. President Cyril, uh, ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, delivering the message containing the decisions uh, of that ANC cabinet, which took place at the weekend, effectively, um, you know, directing cabinet, um, which is scheduled to meet soon to discuss the government priorities of the year, which, of course, will build into uh, that state of the nation address that uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, this time as president of the country, uh, will be giving, uh, telling us what the priorities are for this year. Um, for his government. Well, to discuss some of what you heard there and more is uh, analyst Onga Mamdimga and will be joined in a moment. I mean, he'll be joined in a moment uh, by Asanda Ngwasheng. Uh, Ongama, good evening. Thanks very much um, for your time. I want to start where the, the, the president started with the um, social compact that has, needs to come um, out of conversations that the government must now have with your organized labor, your organized business, and civil society. Just, I mean, we've heard this, we've heard about this social compact um, for, for, for a while now. Discussions have been going on at NetNet, and of course there are as many views or opinions of whether uh, the NEDLEC process is actually delivering what it ought to deliver. Um, there are as many views on that, I think, as there are people prepared to um, talk about it. Just your thoughts on this idea of renegotiating a social compact. Um, good evening, uh, Vuyo, and your viewers, as well as to Asanda. There. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. So, Indeed, there is recognition that in South African political, social, political, economic life, the voices of business and organized labor as well as government are not enough when it comes to crafting workable solutions for South Africa, especially creating a, a path to economic recovery that is inclusive. That's a given. What's a challenge? And then in fact, I think I like the fact that there's recognition that a much wider range of social uh, economic actors need to be involved around the table in crafting a social compact. I think there are two things that I would like to highlight in terms of that. First of all, first of all the, there should be recognition on the part of government that development or socioeconomic transformation doesn't start when government begins to craft an official program. There are people that are responding, there are organizations that are responding to their challenges as they confront them in their communities. So part of what's needed is to recognize what's being done and change policy to enable more of what people do. So one way to do this, for example, is to change the entire framework of support as far as government funding is concerned for economic development projects, where you find that there's too much fixation with uh, measurements that are pro-business, while those uh, things which cannot be measured by the instruments of uh, you know, balance sheets and income statements and uh, proven uh, sales over a period of time 
actually do exist and can be enabled. So an example of this would be if you go to many of the rural areas, you'll find that there's production taking place, for example, for uh, 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 commodities like maize, there's vegetables, among other things. The only thing that makes those not counted when the national stock of maize is counted is the fact that it's not traded in formal markets. So the point I'm making is that when you development work that is inclusive doesn't start when government recognizes a need for a social compact that includes other stakeholders. There must also be recognition that there are things which communities do that just need funding, that just need enabling infrastructure. Some of the uh, uh, the things that keep rural communities, for example, out of the formal production of agricultural products is not lack of a social contract, but lack of infrastructure, road infrastructure in particular, that keeps those communities productive as they are out of mainstream economic uh, value chains. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so I like the fact that, for example, if you look at what the uh, Industrial Development Corporation started doing last year, calling for proposals from social employment uh, uh, pra- practices, that to me is going to deliver results quicker because the framework is being changed there and we need more funds that are geared towards enabling socio-economic activities which do not fall in the traditional measurement tools of uh, uh, free market capitalism. Uh, Asanda, the, the, from, 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 from the statement, um, it says um, this compact um, should set out specific obligations and commitment uh, commitments from uh, you know each of the partners in other words government business labor um, and, and 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 community in other words stop talking in general terms um, and there must also be uh, a trade-offs I think that um, our government misses one very critical thing um, in every in every kind of policy making that it does, which is that you can't, you know, as as has already been said, uh, the work of development doesn't start when government develops a project. And I think that the work of government, which they often fail at, is to create an enabling environment, and that requires removing institutional barriers to trade which is one of the biggest issues that you have in South Africa. And of course, the secondary one is removing, you know, the rampant corruption of the African National Congress and 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 its its employees in government. Because if you look at vehicles like the NYDA, these are the kind of vehicles that should be delivering up, upon us, you know, the people that they have been funding for the past, uh, you know, 28 plus years. And they should be showing us those people and showing us those people being at a tertiary uh, you know, seg- at a tertiary part of the economy at this point. But you're not getting that because that money was used for corruption. It was given to friends and family. And this continues to be, the, these are the kinds of things that continue to hamstring us where in money is dished out for development, for entrepreneur support. But then it doesn't reach real entrepreneurs. It reaches those who are on the patronage line, who are standing in the queue of the gravy train and are related to politicians or somehow have a relationship you know, with politicians or are, are, are looking to support politicians in their next you know, uh, bid for, for, for the presidency or whatever it is. And then secondly, you have a situation wherein we as a country, and we in particular as black people, were outside of the economy. And as a result of being outside of the economy, there are multiple businesses that were built out of that being outside. And there hasn't been any research, for example, on the power of spaza shops and how spaza shops managed to actually you know, raise people, to educate people, and to develop intergenerational wealth for families. 
And the re and, and what we've done instead is we have allowed spaza shops to become this unregulated business. We have we have allowed various new incomers, whether you're talking Somali nationals or you're talking other nationals from across the African continent, to be the leaders in spaza shops. And when locals complain about government's inability to support spaza shops, we then call them xenophobic. And worse than calling them xenophobic, we then say they don't know entrepreneurship and they don't understand the very industry and the very business that they built. And they need the newcomers to now come and show them and teach them about entrepreneurship. And there are so many other examples of a, of a failure by government to think through things in ways that require in, in, institutionalized analysis that looks at what are the barriers to trade and what are the reasons why people who seemingly have every single desire and are determined and have put in all their life savings into things, they're not able to get anywhere. If you try as a, as a SMME to get funding from government, contrary to what I've just said, you might get a little bit if you call yourself a spaza shop or if you call yourself the traditional black businesses. Black professionals are not supported in any way. And yet black professionals are the ones who have been employing people during this COVID period as they're providing services, whether online or physically. And these are some of the things that we need to think about. You can't just create, you know, these uh, tepiso thousand jobs or the PWP project that is like three months jobs and they say, no, we're creating jobs, we're changing the economy. No, you have to look at the structure of the economy and say, how are we and how are our policies impediments to the very development we want to do. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about even the program of providing housing, for example. The ANC has failed and has failed, you know, for, 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 for two decades in providing housing. Why has the government not delivered land to people? Because people actually want land more than they want a house. Why has the government not delivered land to people so that people can build their own houses, so that we can unlock, you know, new new cities, new towns. If you go to Limpopo province, for example, in Pulukwane, there are human beings who basically are growing Limpopo in the direction that they see it going. And government is going to come in after seven years and say, there are too many informal settlements in Limpopo. What are we going to do? When government should be shaping that development and figuring out why is that city growing in this direction and not in that direction? And how do we support the city instead of keeping people in a permanent state of informality and a permanent state of underdevelopment that we don't even bother to research, but we continue to call people, you know, people living in informal settlements when they have been living in these informal settlements for almost three generations. I don't know if uh, this, at least in part, answers uh, your question. Um, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa yesterday, yesterday spoke about a special service delivery cluster or other appropriate institutional arrangement that he said should be put in place to improve overall service delivery in areas such as housing, water, and sanitation. This is in direct response, he said, to community concerns about the poor state of this critical infrastructure across a number of municipalities. I mean, I think, I think that it's, it's good that, you know, Sir Ramaphosa is very good at talking the language that makes it seem like he's going to solve the problems that have plagued the ANC, of which he's been part of for almost, you know, for more than 10 years now directly in the deputy presidency and now in the presidency. And for me, the, the, the biggest issue is that the ANC is very good at coming up with solutions too little too late at every given point. And I think that one of the things that they constantly fail at doing, as was alluded to earlier, is that they don't go to a place and say, in East London, what are people doing you know, around issues of homelessness? What are people doing around issues of lack of sanitation in schools and all of that? And how do we support the work that's already happening? 
We are communities, as I've said earlier, who under apartheid were building schools. We are communities who under apartheid were building community halls, were implementing entire programs without funding, except for crowdsource funding within the community. And the government came and said, stop that, don't do anything, we will do everything for you, and then press the pause button. And so you have a situation where you have South Africans who have grown up in a country where they are crippled. And you have a government that has constantly promised people and delivered nothing. And so you've got two sets of people between government and the people, both are disappointed. Whereas if government had from get go, or at least at some point realized that, for instance, as I said earlier, we're not going to be able to deliver houses at the level that the need for houses is, then they, they, they should have gone to communities to say, how do we deliver how do we deliver on the lack of, on the landlessness? Because our people don't suffer from lack of housing, they suffer from landlessness. And if you go to an informal settlement, you will see Vuyo, that people suffer from basic things like being unable to connect electricity because they don't own the land upon which they are on. And so even when there are electric connections, they are not legal. Go to any informal settlement in Cape Town and you will see this. And where the government has taken the step and has put in the, the, the electricity, various other infrastructure cannot be delivered because the land upon which people sit is not land that can be developed further. And in fact, they should have been moved 20 years ago. And so for as long as you have those kind of issues, we are going to be stuck in this permanent, we need to change things, we need to do this. What we need to start looking at is how does this government or any government for that matter, begin to deliver people led development? How do you begin to listen to what it is that people want on their land, that people want in their cities, that people want in their towns, and then build development based on that instead of coming in from the top down because McKinsey said, because Bain said, because all these consultants who half of the time are staffed by people who have never lived in these local areas to begin with. And so these are some of the issues that we have. And unfortunately, we are stuck with a government that is deaf as far as I'm concerned because analysts have been saying this, academics have been saying this, people in civil society have been saying this from time immemorial. So I'm not impressed by Sir Ramaphosa suddenly sounding like he finally listened to a great a great presentation on the social impact, uh, on the social compact and, and delivering it to us. What we really need to see is, an in, is not just intention, but action on the ground that showcases that our government is willing to pursue people-led development and is willing to pursue it at the pace and at the level that communities deem. Oh, oh, I mean, the, 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 I mean, uh, 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 Sir Lama yesterday said uh, all these interventions that are needed or are going to be embarked upon uh, need to be, quote, labor intensive. And uh, whether it's maintaining community infrastructure or whether it's dealing with our energy uh, 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 crisis from shortages and load shedding, um, or whether it's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, public works uh, 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 programs. But then again, as uh, 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 as Sandra was saying, uh, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, say, but we've had all of that uh, uh, before and nothing uh, from what has been said or what was said yesterday actually suggests uh, uh, that uh, there's going to be uh, a real action this time around. So the common thread from the presidency of President Cyril Ramaphosa has been to me a penchant, a penchant to uh, craft duplicitous efforts which reflect failure to apply oneself to the structure and institutions and processes of government and lead with a laser focus in order to make sure that results are achieved. So yes, indeed, we must have uh, public works programs that are job creating. We must have a focus on, you know, job creation on initiatives that are being undertaken. But just to drive this point that I just mentioned, government doesn't lack the ability to monitor 
or to get information about what's happening as far as service delivery is concerned. One, you have government departments that are that ought to play a role. One, in, from an intergovernmental relations perspective, when things were done correctly, not only was national government able to evaluate what municipalities are doing on the ground, it was also able to accredit municipalities and be able to devolve more functions on those municipalities, on more national government functions on those municipalities that show capability. So, for example, in the issue of housing, the, Depart the National Department of Housing used to do that. Accred evaluate municipalities, accredit municipalities so that they could have a lot more uh, devolution of services. Two, you've got national treasury that gets reports from municipalities. Three, you've got a department of cooperative governance. And then lastly, you've got organizations that operate outside of government like the SALGA and the Cities Network. What more can you create by way of institutions to respond to the same problem? I mean, this just shows to me that government, the, the, the leadership, the, the executive political leadership is so clueless about what's happening under their own government that they don't even recognize what flow of information is there? And how can they lead in a factual data-driven data way if they don't have that information about the basic institutions that help them uh, oversee what's happening at the at, at, at a national level? So this penchant for duplicitous institutions, uh, even though those institutions are formal, to me, is 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 tantamount to what we have described as building shadow institutions because the institutions that uh, are supposed are designed to work are not working so people who are with corrupt intentions will build shadow institutions it doesn't mean when those institutions are announced formally and uh, and, and 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 you know have the cover of uh, formality and and acceptance that they stop being conduits for extraction of rents from the national fiscals. Well, of course, I mean, corruption is uh, something, um, you know, they apparently spoke about um, as well, the need to build a capable and ethical development, uh, a, a developmental state, uh, but also uh, making sure that uh, the corruption that he says has damaged the ANC's standing as a servant of the people and leader of society, uh, that they need to make a decisive break with the practices that have caused this decline in our standing, you, we will cease to be a trusted and effective agent of change. Now, all these words were said, you know, in an environment uh, that was clearly... Uh, 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 less than ideal. If you look at, you know, what has been happening, you know, the the ping pong game um, of letters and 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 statements between the presidency and uh, Lindy Wesisulu. We know for a fact um, that uh, with uh, you know an elective conference in December, you know the 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 the, the first salvos, you know, have been have been fired already and people are beginning to position themselves. I mean, the various factions um, and personalities are beginning to position themselves. Now, so all these good things that need to happen at government level, whether it's, uh, you know, repurposing the institutions uh, of government, whether it's doing all the right things the two of you uh, were talking about or correcting the wrongs uh, that have been seen there, all of that is going to happen within this atmosphere that is going to be toxic. Uh, 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 you know, what do you think is going to happen? So I, I like the fact that you are linking the culture of the ANC, the elective conference, as well as the section in the statement that talks about building a capable state. Here is a problem of South Africa. The ANC has allowed itself to morph into a, the kind of organization that uh, is a criminal enterprise. And 
all evidence, whether it's at a regional or municipal level, at a provincial level or national level, there is no doubt whatsoever that the ANC has become a criminal enterprise. Now, the only, one of the biggest ways in which the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa could have, could have saved the country is to do what the Eastern Cape uh, ANC was talking about leading to Nazareth. The idea of having um, the rank and file membership in its entirety voting for delegates of uh, uh, voting for the leadership of the party. Why is that important? Because it is easy to manipulate 5,000 people coming to a conference. It is not so easy to do so when you have the entire rank and file membership of the party voting. Secondly, the party talks about renewal all the time, but one basic thing, which is common sense, that should have been done and has not been done is this. The party should have come up with a, a, a criteria that candidates must first pass before they are eligible to be voted for. They have not done that. The reason why one is saying this is because you have, even currently, People across the factional divide, including those that are purportedly supporting President Cyril Ramaphosa, alleged to have committed huge amounts of corruption, but they are in the faction that supports the ambitions of the president, and then others are on the RT faction. All of them have been allowed to campaign and, and secure offices within lower structures of the party. How are you going to prevent the, because the, the, the biggest thing was to make sure that the ANC as a brand is protected from criminal networks. However, that basic thing has, they, they failed to lead on that. On the issue of who votes for the leadership of the party, and secondly, who is eligible. And in fact, on the eligibility, they didn't even need to work much because they've got uh, the, through the eye of the needle document, they've got the leadership on leadership renewal, the document on leadership renewal, and the uh, successive institution making that's been around the integrity commission. All they simply needed to do was to say, this is now going to constitute criteria for who can be elected. So if people want to elect a particular leader, first, this due diligence must be done before the name can be uh, accepted as a nominee for a conference. And that criteria should go beyond issues of who has been charged. It should include things like, for example, who's brought the party into disrepute, who has brought municipalities into disrepute. And stop this thing of somebody has ruined a municipality and they get deployed to parliament. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, everything, uh, Asanda, everything that uh, uh, Ongama just said uh, uh, takes me to a, an interview I'm doing next um, with Godrich Gadi, who is a lawyer, um, to Mervyn Dix, who is um, an ANC MP. He's going to court tomorrow to challenge his suspension because he's been suspended from taking part um, in activities of Parliament Standing Committee on Finance. Uh, a scoper. The ANC suspended uh, uh, Mervyn last week after he wrote to scoper chairperson um, saying that, uh, asking uh, that uh, he institute a probe into allegations that uh, state funds were used um, uh, in ANC internal election campaigns in, 20, in 2017 during the you know, a uh, 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 build up to, to, to that elective conference. Now, in his letter, Dix claims that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa was aware that state funds were used for ANC internal campaigns. But not only did the head of state not act, he also failed to report the matter to the Zondo Commission when he got a chance um, 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 to do so. So he, the, the ANC had the weekend, incidentally, um, approved a National Working Committee recommendation that um, disciplinary action be instituted against the Dirks. Asanda? I mean, that's just typical ANC. I, I hear Ongama, you know, 
building this very nice alternative view that is never going to happen of accountability, of due diligence, of criteria for leadership, etc. That's not going to happen. The reason it's not going to happen is because the very NEC itself reads like a list of the accused at the Zondo Commission. And if that is the case, then are we saying that the very people who are accused are going to be the very people that are going to determine the route of punishment that they themselves sitting in that same committee should face? So this is typical ANC style of anybody that speaks the truth, anybody that seeks to uncover further the corruption and the rot within the ANC gets sidelined, gets allegations against them. And eventually uh, there's a way that, you know, a way is found to, to disappear him. And yet those who deserve and should be removed swiftly are not. For an example, we're coming out of a crisis in the ANC. We're coming out of an NEC. Esma uh, Khashule, former Secretary General, why has he not been removed? Why is his suspension still standing? Why have they not found a replacement for him? Because that's a critical position for a political party that's going into its elective conference by December, if we are to, to listen to some of the, you know, the dates that are being bandied about. Why would you leave such a critical, a critical position open for so long? Also, if you look at the rest of the list of the various people who have been suspended, at which point do we say you have been suspended for long enough, you are now actually fired and kicked out of potentially your, not only your position, but the political party, because you brought it into disrepute. But that's not going to happen. And the reason it's not going to happen is because, you know, we were once told and we should have listened that everybody in the ANC has small and skeletons. And so the minute you try to pull someone's skeleton out, they go to your cupboard and they bring out your skeletons. If you just look at the president of the African National Congress, Sir Maposa himself, he has been trying to be president for the past 28 years. And not only was he so hell-bent on being the president, he was so hell-bent that nothing was going to stand in his way. He was willing to be the deputy president to one of the most corrupt presidents South Africa has ever seen. And in that time, in that entire period, he did nothing while the state was looted. He had all the powers as a deputy president to implement various means from looking to the legislature to looking to various other arms of government. But he didn't do any of those things because he wasn't interested in South Africa and making sure that there's clean governance in South Africa. He was interested in the position of the president of the ANC, which guaranteed him the position of the president of South Africa. So in a roundabout way, what I'm trying to say is, what is a few people using state, using state funds to, you know, grease some palms in order to make sure that the man gets the position that he has been going, gunning for? If Cyril Ramaphosa can sit for 10 years and watch our country decimated, to within an inch of its life and do nothing, how do we even begin to believe that he is going to hold people accountable, especially if those people are alleged to be people who were pushing for his agenda and his presidential campaign? This is the problem that we have in South Africa. We have people who are so selfish and so self-centered that they will cut off their nose to spite their face. If you look at what's happening, in the African National Congress right now, the entire political party is willing to destroy brand South Africa, all the state institutions and everything to do with this country in order for them to access power as individuals. I have never seen in my life anything that is so ludicrous that you are willing to destroy the very thing that you are fighting for. Can you imagine? A, 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 a government made up of politicians who are so hell-bent on power, if they have to destroy half of the empire they want, 
That's what they will do. We are living right now as South Africans in Lord of the Rings. If you've ever read a book called Lord of the Rings, we are living in George Orwell's 1984. This is Animal Farm. And it's scary to live, to see, and to witness, and to know that we are still bringing children into this world and hoping for a future under this South Africa, under this African National Congress. And this is why I've taken to saying that the question that South Africans need to keep asking themselves is what is the relevance of the ANC? And at which point do we admit as a country that the ANC is a danger and is the biggest danger to our democracy as things stand? If you have a government and a governing party that will watch every single key point burn in order to prove a point to each other, what more do we need this political party to do before we realize that they have no interest in the welfare of South Africans? But what they do have an interest in is power and access to power by all means and any means necessary. And if they have to burn down the entire South Africa and be left only with the union buildings upon which they will then rule all of us peasants, that's what they are willing to do. And at some stages, South Africans, we're going to have to take a very tough stance and say, no more ANC, no more will be held hostage by a, a million point four registered members in a country of 55 million people. We really need to start figuring out as a country, what does South Africa look like beyond the ANC, without the ANC? Because they have shown us that if there was ever a threat and a danger to this here country, it is them. And it is in their best interest that we get so depressed and so mired in their shenanigans that we don't recognize that they have actually given us the best and the most powerful weapon that we have had since 1994 when we all looked up at them with hope like little children looking at Father Christmas. And just a final thought uh, from you, Ongama. You know, I mean, we've opened this year with the big ANC stories being the Lindy West Sulu matter or matters. Um, and now there is this pending uh, 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 Scopa probe. Well, Scopa has said, the chairperson of Scopa, um, Kulego Shlengwa, says um, that probe, in fact, that is going to uh, continue irrespective of the suspension uh, uh, that uh, Mervyn Dirks has been subjected to by the, uh, by the ANC. And it's interesting, speaking to ANC people at the weekend, you have uh, one group of people that feels, for example, that um, uh, Mervyn Dirks is a factionalist and uh, he's doing this, you know, um, uh, for, 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 for a reason. Some, those people who want to have a go at Ramaphosa think uh, that this is one of the things that they can throw at him. On the other hand, other people are saying, look, uh, it shouldn't matter what uh, Mervyn Dix is trying to do or whose agenda he may well be promoting. Um, isn't it, isn't this taking us back to where the ANC was, where it was prepared, you know, to do anything and everything, you know, uh, destroy the country if uh, need be, uh, if that's what it took? you know, to defend the leader. Because in this case, why don't you allow uh, a, a President Cyril Ramaphosa to go before, appear before Scopa and explain himself? I, I have no doubt, Vuyo, that Mervyn Dirk is acting as part of a factional ploy to get the president to hang himself in parliament. I have no doubt about that. But that notwithstanding, it's very embarrassing for the ANC to do what it has done in the name of party discipline. Indeed, it's a systemic flaw in parliamentary systems that the close proximity between the executive and parliament through the relationships at the level of the party makes parliament toothless. That's a systemic flaw, right? But notwithstanding the, 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 that, that systemic flaw, 
I think that it was clumsy for them to try and suspend the MP, factional as he is, who has raised a legitimate question about a president who is was in the know about people who have uh, who allegedly siphoned money from government coffers in order to run their campaigns. That he even had the audacity to say it on a platform of the NEC reflects to me the very 1980s, 60s mentality of the ANC of avoiding MPMP and sellouts. And, 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 And that thing about him uh, trying to project himself to a faction that has criticized him to be a, a sellout as a person who's brave enough not to draw, not to drag the party down and sacrificially prefers for the CR-17 bank statements to be the only issue. That just is the flawed logic of ANC thinking, in my view. There should have been something done by the president about those campaigns whom he alleges were... Uh, 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 had siphoned money from government. So, 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 so it's embarrassing that the party has attempted to, to suspend Mervyn Dirks, notwithstanding my uh, 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 view that he, in fact, is acting on a fictional line. Um, and, and in fact, it's going to backfire for all of them. Uh, uh, this. And then on the issue of Lindu Sisulu, uh, Minister Lindu Sisulu uh, Vuyo, the thing is, and I don't know why this is a, a national debate. There was never que- there were never questions about how South Africa is not working for the rest of the of the of the public. That's not even the debate. The debate is her scapegoating the constitution for that. It's her scapegoating the constitution for political arrangements between business people and 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 and, 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 and senior politicians. She says under a constitutional uh, uh, democracy. We have allowed some to have more other. Where does the constitution come in there? The very constitution whose preamble actually states it very clear that economic justice has got to be a center of our government. So I think she was mischievous in her approach in scapegoating the constitution. And she knew exactly what she was doing, that with the her party has gotten to a stage where if you want to be popular with a, 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 to a certain grouping, you need to attack the constitutional order of the Republic. She could have made the point which has been made by everybody else. There's consensus about inequality in South Africa. It's not, it's, it's, it's been something recognized from the mid seventies already that there, were, there was a dual economy here. So in order for her to achieve whatever political objectives she had in mind, she just had to find this one thing that was going to make a, a topic for the month. And I think that it's cheap politics. Uh, thanks to both of you um, for carrying this conversation this evening on the back of that ANC uh, meeting that was held at the weekend, effectively um, discussing what cabinet would then have to uh, fine tune as the program for uh, the country this uh, year. Uh, to this story, which we touched on uh, with uh, Asanda and Ongama, ANC MP Mervyn Dix is heading to the courts to challenge his suspension from taking part in activities of Parliament's Standing Committee on Public Accounts, SCOPA. The ANC suspended Dix last week after he wrote to SCOPA Chairperson IFP MP Mkulekwa Shengwa asking him to institute a probe into allegations that state funds were used in ANC internal election campaigns during the build-up to the 2017 Governing Party elective conference. In his letter, Dix claims that Ramaphosa was aware that state funds were used to fund internal ANC campaign, but not only did the head of state not act, he failed to support the mat- to report the matter rather uh, to the Zondo Commission when he appeared before it. This past weekend, the ANC National Executive Committee approved a National Working Committee recommendation that disciplinary action be taken against Dix. Tomorrow, he's heading to the courts where he'll be represented by lawyer Godrich Gadi, who joins us via Zoom from Cape Town, where he has just landed. Good evening, sir. Thanks very much for your time. Good evening.
Good evening, uh, Vuyo, and good evening to our viewers. Your client's going to court. What is he looking for? Every citizen who is of the view that an injustice has been visited upon him or her has a right to uh, approach our courts in South Africa for redress. And in this regard, our client, Honorable uh, Marvin Deft, uh, is of the view that an injustice has been visited upon him. Mm -hmm. what, what specifically is the relief he is seeking? Well, uh, he would like, like uh, the status quo to remain prior to the purported uh, precautionary suspension and uh, to, to continue with his uh, duties and functions as a member of the National Assembly, mm -hmm. as a member of the uh, uh, Standing Committee on uh, Public Accounts, and as a whip at SCOPA, and as a question whip of the ANC in SCOPA. Mm -hmm. And when is this matter before the courts? Hopefully tomorrow by 10 a.m. We should be live uh, at the Cape Town High Court. Mm -hmm. And uh, when are you? When uh, is uh, is is the ANC and Parliament and whoever else um, uh, you've uh, listed there? Uh, when are they expected to file responding affidavits? Well, in terms of the notice of motion that we have served them, they should have filed by uh, 8 p.m. today, and uh, hopefully they will file not later than the, the end of midnight. Some interesting little things uh, uh, coming through I mean, from those papers, like it has been taken out of uh, WhatsApp groups, um, you know, um, and he's not to interact with uh, um, his colleagues. Um, just take us through some of those. Well, uh, he has been uh, unleashed with a precautionary suspension, which has got conditions of the suspension amongst which he must never speak to the media and he must not present himself as a, as a member of uh, the SCOPA committee and he has, um, uh, uh, should not actually attend uh, any committees of parliament because he has not been assigned any committee of parliament. Mm -hmm. There's also a part which talks about, um, uh, you know, uh, the ANC uh, essentially meddling in, uh, in the work of parliament. Take us through what the arguments are there in the main. Well, uh, Voyo, we are arguing in the main in court that uh, the chief whip of the ANC assumed powers that she does not have. Every political party has got a right discipline its own members. However, that political party has an obligation to follow its own constitution, its own rules and regulations and code of conduct. And in particular, in this uh, instance, Rule 25 of the ANC. And uh, in the circumstances, having perused all the papers and correspondence that we have, nowhere do we see uh, any structure called ANC caucus or an ANC official called the uh, chief whip who has been uh, 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 delegated with those powers. And uh, we shall argue that uh, she has uh, acted ultra virus and uh, she has assumed powers that she does not have. Remind us again of uh, the reason why uh, Mr. Dex did this in the first place. In other words, why uh, he decided to write to the chairperson of SCOPA uh, asking that, um, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this matter be, be, be probed and perhaps the president be brought before the committee to answer some questions. Why did he do that? Well, in our consultation with our client, we were made to understand that he did what he did uh, in terms of the duties imposed upon him by the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa. And uh, as a patriotic citizen, and uh, in terms of uh, 
all related uh, uh, acts of, in the country, the Prevention and Combating of uh, Corruption Act. And uh, as a patriotic citizen and as a member of SCOPA, he has an obligation uh, not to look the other side when actually a, 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 a prima facie a evidence of a wrongdoing has come to his attention, which has got an impact on the public purse and on the public funds, on the taxpayers' money. And he, he did exactly what is expected of him by the Constitution and the rules of Parliament. Quick one, on your part, how's life uh, in court chambers compared to uh, life on the benches of parliament? Well, uh, I don't have much to say there, but I believe that uh, the court is another trench of the struggle for justice to our people. And uh, we're looking forward to that exciting uh, engagement in the courts. Uh, throughout South Africa. Thank you very much uh, for your time uh, this evening, Godri Skadi, who is the lawyer uh, representing uh, ANC MP Mervyn Dix, who's going to the courts tomorrow to challenge his suspension from taking part in activities of Parliament Standing Committee on Public Accounts, SCOPA. And that's our program uh, for tonight. Do join us again tomorrow evening, 8 p.m. sharp. Have a good night. Thank you.